All right, so we are on class 20 out of 20 for unit one. So congrats to making it here to the end. Um, we're gonna do Angular part three, try to teach you just a little bit more about Angular to give you a good foundation. I wish there were, there's lots of more to learn and I wish I could teach it to you all because it's super cool. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, some of the next steps you could take if you wanted to learn a little more. Um, there's some great courses on Udemy, especially recommend um, Max Schwartzmuller. He has a fantastic course on Angular. Uh, so let's go ahead and move through this. We got a classic format tonight. So we'll come back for a studio um, recap after your studio for the last half hour. So um, Monday is your catch up class, the last one. And you're just gonna go straight to your TA groups at 5.30 when you get um, online. Uh, there's no like guest speaker or anything. You'll just go straight in and uh, work on whatever last assignments you're trying to wrap up um, or anything else you need to get help from your TAs on. Um, and as a reminder, all sixth graded assignments have to have a score of one out of one. And the deadline, official deadline is actually midnight for that. Um, not just the end of class. Uh, uh, Colin and I were talking about it and it, we're going to be consistent with what it says in Canvas. So, um, and then of course, two week break and we'll be back for Java unit on January 5th. Okay. So part three, we're going to talk about one way data binding and specifically about property binding and attribute binding and how you can use that for dynamic styling. And then we will, um, I'm going to show you how to pass data between components. It's not something that your chapter actually uh, talks about directly. They kind of allude to it, but it is something that they, they have you do as part of your graded assignment six. So I wanted to go ahead and model it for you anyway. So let's talk about one-way data binding. Um, essentially, this just refers to the fact that anything that's in TypeScript will update automatically on your page in the view. And so it's one way in that sense, whatever is in TypeScript will then be reflected on the page. So you can you know, use this special syntax that I've been teaching you uh, to place your variables or your expressions in your HTML template. And then um, it knows automatically to update from there. So two-way data binding does exist. Um, it's particularly useful for uh, input fields, if you want the user's input to automatically update the variable in the TypeScript file, so it goes back the other direction. Um, it's not also not something that we have time to teach you about, but um, if you're interested in doing that, if you're you know, going to do a project with uh, more complex forms in particular, um, look up ng-model. That's kind of the primary um, syntax that's used for that, um, but it can be done for other things too. Uh, but we're, we're going to focus on one way. So just remember, like we talked about last class, you have to use a combination of one-way data binding and event binding to update TypeScript from the view if, if the user has input or does something on the page that changes things. Okay, so we're gonna learn a new syntax for one-way data binding for properties. So you already know how to use text interpolation. This is how you've been displaying things on the page so far, where you use the uh, double you know, fancy braces um, but there's a preferred syntax called property binding, where you use square brackets around the attribute that's in the tag, and then you just get rid of the curly braces and just put that TypeScript variable or expression between the quotes. So in this example here, you can see that we've got, um, you know, the first example shows the old way, the text interpolation with first name between those curly braces inside the quotes. So the better way to do it, um, generally preferred, is to put those brackets, so square brackets around the attribute value, and then um, just use the variable name directly in the quotes. So we can look at an example of this in here. Um, I've got a bunch of examples here, but um, we'll look at them one at a time. So this uh, is an example of where in the TypeScript file, I've just gone ahead and set this to an initial value, Ariana, as the first name, so that we have some sort of default, but maybe eventually the name would get changed. And so then this we would have an event to store it or whatever. So then, um, you know, you come over to the template and right here, you've got uh, this input and we just use this property binding here with value 
to make sure that the field actually represents the first name inside the field to begin with. So it actually has the text right there in the field. And um, that's a very, very straightforward way to do that. And you can do that with lots of different um, things. And we'll ha have other examples in a minute. Uh, we don't need that yet. <laughs> and so then, of course, on the page, I'm I'm swiping at things that don't exist. I told you guys I'm out of my flow. I'm going to I'm going to be, you know, stumbling around here on my trackpad. Um, wrong example there again. OK, so <laughs> we have here um, this input field, first name, Ariana, and you can see it's already present. You know, I can refresh the page and it's there because it's pulling it in and it's doing it with that property binding syntax with the square brackets. Um, so that's that example. Now we'll come back to here. And evidently I lost my slideshow. So hold please. Oh, wow. Is it going to do this every time? It very well might do this every time. Fun. Okay. Uh, here we go. Attribute binding. Um, Ian, you have a question before I start in on this one. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, is this similar to defaulting like we learned in um, just doing it in JavaScript? Yeah, uh, you're talking about where I did it with the input, the, the value on the input? Yeah. Yeah, that's essentially what I was doing is just giving it a default value so that it already puts something in the field. Okay. Um, but you certainly can use it on things other than inputs. Um, you know, we'll ha I'll have more examples for you in a minute. Um, Okay, so uh, attribute binding. So this is very similar to property binding, but it gives you a way to actually access the properties on things like um, style and class, and you just use dot notation. So um, you can use it with string variables or expressions um, from TypeScript to add dynamic styling. And you can use it with Boolean variables or expressions to apply conditional classes. So. Um, only if it, you know, resolves to true would that class then be added to that element. So here's a couple examples. We have, um, you know, the first one is a just a little paragraph um, tag, and I've got this color where instead of um, having the color defined elsewhere, I'm defining it through um, a TypeScript value called message color. Um, and using this, you know, square brackets around style dot color. I can change that color property of the style attribute. Um, so this is, you know, going to basically make it so that it's in line, right? It's just adding it in line to the element. And then, of course, I've got a, a message in here, and that's what's going to be that's what's going to be changed. Um, so that's that's attribute binding for dynamic style. And then the second example, we have this uh, div that's being looped, um, and inside it is a span that. Uh, is wrapped around a word. And this has a conditional class. It's only going to apply this bold class that I've created if the word that is the current word from the array that's being looped includes the text script, um, those characters, you know, that particular like substring. Um, otherwise, it won't be bold. Um, so this is an example of attribute binding for conditional class. Um, so let's look at the code. I think first, if I can find it. Here we go. Okay, so here's our message. Congrats, you are almost done with unit one. <laughs> and the message color, I've got it set to default to C green. Um, and, you know, the, the real value here is maybe you have some reason, and I have not gone to the lengths of actually, you know, creating all the logic for this, but maybe you have some reason why you might want to change the color. And this would be a great way to do it so that you could just change this value and update this message color and it would automatically apply it. So right now I've got it hard coded and that's fine. So um, you can treat it like a default. And so over in the template, you know, here's the paragraph with the um, style being applied through attribute binding, style.color, and uh, it's wrapped around this message. Uh, and then of course, over in, um, Nathan, you got a question? Yeah, I mean, it can it can wait till you're done talking though, if you if you want. Sure. Okay. So I'll show you the um, actual example in the browser here. So you can see that I've got that text, and that color has been applied. And if we go over and look, hang on, got to move the zoom thing. I don't know where I'm going to move it. Here, let's put it down here. That'll work. <laughs> so I can get to my tabs and get to all of this. Okay. Uh, right. So I want the 
selector here, make sure I get to the right thing. There we are. So um, I can't quite see this. Seriously spoiled with my second monitor. Okay, uh, so you can see here, we've got the P right here and it says style equals color C green. So it's you know placed that inline syntax um, like you normally use in the DOM um, right there and given it the color with the style attribute. So that's kind of the corresponding you know HTML, you know final kind of computed HTML from the, the special angular syntax that we used where we, you know, we're using the style that color inside the brackets like this. Okay, Nathan, you still got a question? Yeah, totally. This is uh, obviously outside of the class, the uh, scope of this lecture, but does Angular also, I mean, can you, I was just thinking you would quickly tie up your HTML and CSS or your HTML and TypeScript if you're uh, putting all these attribute bindings in there. Is there a way to bind into uh, your CSS file directly, or is that outside of what Angular does? No, okay. Yeah, no. Um, you know, the only the only way that it does that is just by reading mm -hmm. from the CSS file if okay. you have something in there. But you can't like so. So then, I guess the other way to do it would be like maybe you have additional style properties, and you have you know, it could be one thing, it could be several things, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. want to do it um, with CSS. Then that's when you use a class, which is the next yeah. thing. And you would just flip those around. Okay. Right. Okay. Cool. So you could just yeah. have a, a, a class. Maybe you have a class called, you know, green or something. And right. you know, that's so you would apply it this way with some yeah. sort of logic conditionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So you would use that as your switch to uh read right. different values from the from the CSS rather than exactly. changing the CSS itself. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility here. Um, I would say that in my experience, um, it's more common to use uh, to, to you know create the class first with whatever attributes um, and properties you want um, in CSS, and then just apply it like this. But it really just kind of it also just kind of depends on how you want to handle your logic. Um, because in this case, this is a boolean, and this is just a straight you know string value that it's applying. So uh, so yeah, so that brings us to the class, the conditional class. Then so you can see here we've got this loop. And I'm checking, um, you know, to see if the word includes uh, script. And I don't need anything in my TypeScript file to do this because I just have this expression that's going to evaluate right here. So I, I don't have any sort of function that has to run. You can do it that way. We'll do that in a minute. But um, in this case, it's I just have an expression here, real quick, uh, to just evaluate this, and then it'll resolve to true or false. And so then if we go over into the browser and look at this, you can see that I've got this list of different tech that you guys are learning. And the only two that are in bold are JavaScript and TypeScript, because those are the ones that actually have that substring script in them. So that's how that's done. Um, and it's really powerful. You can do a lot of really cool things to conditionally apply styling um, and other things that a class provides, You know, even structure and things like that. Um, by uh, by using this um, attribute binding. <laughs> Again, with the, uh, okay, really? All right, I would just keep it in full screen except for the whole like, you know, right side of the screen problem. Okay, uh, I should have switched screens first. That's okay, I'll figure this out guys. We actually don't have very many slides tonight. That's the good news. Grant, you got a question? Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, so that conditional class, uh, class dot bold, mm -hmm. is that in the the yes. .cs file? Yeah, I meant to show that to you. I apologize. Okay, so uh, if I come over here to, yeah, it's right here. So that this is absolutely a case where you're defining it in a CSS file that it has access to, and then you're just applying it to the element based on whether it's true or false. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the part that's not in your chapter. Um, to pass data between components, you're going to use um, property binding, um, but you have to do it in combination with this decorator. So um, the property binding syntax with the square brackets around the attribute, um, in this case, though, instead of an attribute, it's actually going to be your um, your uh, target variable that you're going to create. So in the child component TypeScript file, you're going to use this decorator. Um, decorators you'll see from time to time, and you're going to use them with other tech um, 
in unit two as well. But in Angular, um, it looks like this with the at symbol at the front. Um, and it allows you to kind of tag a variable um, to give it some extra functionality that's built into the framework. So in this case, um, Angular says, you know, if you put this at input decorator on the front of your variable, um, that tells Angular that it's going to receive its value from um, the parent, but you actually apply it within the child class. And then once you've done that and you kind of initialize it to some sort of default value and it can just be something empty, that's fine uh, because it's going to get, it's it's not, it needs, TypeScript uh, needs it to have some sort of value if it's not in like a traditional TypeScript class um, constructor. But uh, it's not important if you're passing it in from the parent. It's just going to update it with whatever's coming in from the parent. Um, and then you just make sure you add input to the list of the imported items at the top that are coming from at Angular slash core, um, because it's one of the things that's built in, but you have to tell it, you know, I want to grab this from that library. Um, and then um, in this uh, example over here, oh yeah, I've got more bullet points, right? In the parent component, um, HTML, you're going to, this is where you use the property binding. You're going to, um, you know, have the target and you're going to have the source. So the target will be the same variable name that is in that child, you know, um, TypeScript file that you're um, putting that input decorator on. And then the source is whatever variable or expression um, from the parent um, is going to generate the value to pass down. And uh, in this case, in this example I've got here, selected item is that source, right? Um, so here I'll just kind of, you know, highlight these again. There's the input decorator. Um, notice that the input director decorator has the, the uh, parentheses on it, right? That's important because it actually is a function. Um, and then uh, in the parent component in the template, you can see where this property binding has been used with the target on the left in the brackets. Um, and that matches this you know, item up here um, in the child component. Um, and then the source, which is coming from the parent file. So let's go over to the code and actually see how this all connects in the different files. I think it helps to see that. Um, and then we will look at kind of how it all plays out on the page. Okay. So if we come over here um, to our app, dot component dot ts this is the parent component uh you can see that i've got you know these items and i have a i have a uh, an interface that i created i put it in a shared folder and i'm importing it and that's where this item is coming from um but it defines these objects and i've got four objects in an array here that can be used right up here in the parent um where i'm kind of you know going to uh, manipulate the data from here and then um will pass down only the item that's selected. So here's the selected item that we're tracking. And I'm just initializing this to the very first thing so that it defaults to just be the first thing in the list. Um, and that way, when we look at it on the page, it'll already be selected as this one. Um, and then I have this little handler that we're gonna use for when the user clicks on the, the different choices. And this is just gonna change it to, you know, whichever one they've, they've selected, it, it'll change it to that item. So that this is what's in the parent component. And then if we switch over to the child component, um, here's where I've used the input director decorator, excuse me, on the item, which is of type item. And I've just initialized it to an object that is, you know, matches the interface, but just has some empty values. Um, maybe they would have like, you know, uh, you know, real values otherwise, but it doesn't matter because in the parent file, we've said, we're actually choosing the first item from the array with the real data that's coming in. And maybe this data would actually be coming in, probably would be coming in from a, an API where you're making a fetch, right? Instead of having dummy data here like I do. In which case, you know, you can't choose um, necessarily, you know, what you want other than to just say it's going to be the first one there. So um, there's lots of ways to do this. This is just one of them. But basically, you just need to make sure you declare it. You need to make sure it has the decorator on it. And then it will be able to pass it from the parent to the child. And then in the child file, um, in the, I'm sorry, not in the child, um, in the parent uh, template, this is where, you know, you place your child component in with the app child tag, right? That's that selector that belongs to the child um, that uh, comes from 
the child's TypeScript file. Remember, those are always based on the selector item right here. So um, that's you know right here. And then you just use this property binding syntax to say, I want the item that's being input to the child to be um, this. What I want passed down from the parent is the selected item that's defined right here. So you just connect one to the other. You got a target and you've got a source and that will pass it down. And so whatever we do with um, all the, and actually let me show you what's going on here. So we have in the parent, we've got this list. Um, this is, I'm using, uh, there's a lot going on here in this tag, but I'm using this NG4 structural directive, let item of items so that I can list all of the items for the user to choose from. And then I've got a click um, event uh, binding here um, to use this handler select item and pass in whichever item it is to uh, actually update it and select you know, the item. So then so selected item is going to have that value because that's what select item does. And then um, I also have, you'll notice a conditional class here that says if it's current, if this is currently the selected one, if item is equal to selected item, then apply the selected class. And that basically just uh, adds, it makes it a different color, the button, um, which will make more sense when we actually look at the page. So let's look at that. If I can find it, here we go. Uh, here we go, okay, yes. So now we see these buttons, right? And you can see that that first one is darker because in this case, item equals selected item, the very first thing in the array. But as soon as I come over here and I switch this, the class, you know, the, the class update updates here where it gives it a new background color, the picture changes um, and the, uh, you know, tag below it changes. And this is, this entire thing right here is the child component, which I did not show you. So let's look at that. Uh, here, nope, here. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is what's in the child component. It just has a little card. It has the image and it has um, the, the name right below it, right? Which we just saw on the page. And all that's going on here is it's just taking that item that was input and it's grabbing the name property here and here. And right here, we're grabbing the image file property and we're calling this build URL function that I wrote in here. Um, that takes the image file name from the data and just makes sure it has the right file path um, in front of it so that it can find it. Because I actually have these in the assets folder down here, these four, these four images. Um, so this is, you know, these are very common ways of putting data together um, to, you know, display things dynamically on a page. Um, you know, what, Lots of different ways to do things. I'm trying to expose you guys to some different ways to do things so that you can start to get a little more familiar with it. Um, so that's it. Uh, you know, you you pass it in and you use it. And in this case, this is how I'm using it. I'm just displaying an image and a name. Um, and so if we go back to here, there we go. But it's, you know, there's not a ton of lines of code to change all of these individual things like you would have to do if you were working in the DOM and, you know, coding all of this from scratch with, um, you know, adding event, different event listeners and, um, you know, changing all the different properties. Basically, you just do everything at the beginning with just, you know, connecting it all and then just let Angular do the rest. Do you have any questions about this? No. Okay. Yeah, Eric. You mentioned that there was uh, something that you needed to put in like the, um, the at Angular input or core or something. Yes. Can you show that please? Absolutely. And I intended to, so thank you. Um, yes. So in the child component TypeScript file where you are using that input decorator, you just have to make sure. So when you first have like a generic component that you start up with, you know, ng generate component, um, it starts out with component and on in it being the only things in here. So all you do is just add input like that. Because it's, you know, one more thing that you've decided you want to pull out of this library to use. And then it's available. Okay. Um, so that's it for the basic examples. Um, so now we can go back over to our garden planning demo. Um, 
and you know take a look at how this works. So uh, we are not going to make a, a massive amount of changes in the functionality of it as it currently exists um, or the way it looks. We're still going to have you know where you can add and remove you know different plants um, and put them in the flower bed. But what we are going to do, we're going to do we're going to do a couple of like conditional things. Um, but we're also going to move some things into child components so that we can see how it actually is better to separate things out into. And this is really what these kinds of frameworks are great for: is separating your code out so that every component has one job. Just like we've kind of taught you guys that every function should have one job, same thing with components. You really do want to separate them out. And Launch Code freely admits in chapter three, <laughs> I'm sorry, in chapter 31, that they know that all the examples they've provided for you so far are not actually best practice in that sense, because they're putting a lot of different things all in one component just to have you practice those things. Um, but trying to teach this stuff, you know, to, to take it to the next level, there's just not enough time. This is a big topic. There's a lot to learn. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of that with this example, and then you'll have a better idea of what it looks like. Um, and then I'm going to kind of show you what limitations we still have, but what I would do next if we had more time. Okay, so let's kind of come over, um, you know, right now we have this main component and everything you see here in this big white section is all in one component. It's all in the main component. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this entire right column over here and take this flower bed um, card that's inside of it and uh, move that into a flower bed component. And then we're going to take every single one of these, which right now we're just looping through and we just have a bunch of code there, we're going to move that into a component so that instead we're looping multiple instances of a component rather than just, you know, a, a chunk of code. Um, and this is going to be much more realistic of how you would do this um, professionally. So let's uh, go over to the code and do that. All right, I have some to-dos here for us. And um, the very first thing is to use property binding to add the name variable to the field, right? So right now, if we come up here and we click on this to uh, save to change the name, there's nothing there. So maybe I clicked on it and I didn't mean to, and I wanna say save and it's like, please enter a name. And I'm like, well, I had a name. Um, so, you know, it's probably better to just have whatever was last saved in there already, right? So let's do that um, here. All right, so right here, I'm just going to use some property binding here, and I'm going to say value equals, and um, I will give it the um, name because if you remember over in the uh, here, that's what the actual um, property name is, name. And that way, whatever is currently saved here, even if it's been overwritten, um, overwritten, sorry, um, it'll just, you know, show the most recent one. So we can kind of prove that now and come over here. So if I click in, I should see my flower bed. There it is. And let's say I, you know, change it to, you know, circular bed uh, under red bud tree. I think that was my example from last time. And I save it. Now we see that. And if I click back in, it remember, you know, it's, it's always going to display the most recent one. So that's, that's a way that that one way binding is really useful is just to make it a little more user friendly and um, with, with a form that a user might kind of go in and out of like that. Um, and then, so that takes care of that particular to do. So we're done with that one. And then number two is to um, add a, a, a conditional unavailable class if plant.num available is zero. So the idea here is that, you know, we can, and I'll come down here to the irises because there's only four of them. I can, you know, allocate these over here. And when I get to zero, instead of this being green, we want to change it to gray. So that kind of grays it out. And it's a better visual indicator of, oh, hey, you're out of those now. You know, you, you, you use them up. So these are little, you know, little user experience things um, that are nice. So um, I can use a conditional class for that because it's just going to check the number. And if the number is zero, it'll apply that class and change the color. Um, so over in the code, um, in the CSS file, that's not it. Here it is. Um, we have unavailable somewhere here. Here it is. Yeah. 
unavailable class and it has this you know light gray color that we're going to use so we'll come back in here and we're just going to add on to this and uh, in the brackets using the attribute binding we'll say class dot unavailable and just set it equal to um, plant dot num available equals zero just like that. So it's a little Boolean expression to just check for the number. And if it equals to zero, it should mark it unavailable. So let's check it. Um, I'm gonna allocate these out. And when I get to zero, there it is, it graded out. Nice, huh? So, uh, you know, little, little tiny things that just make for a better experience. Um, and it's real easy to do with that uh, one-way binding like that with the, uh, with the attributes to tap right into your CSS. Okay. Um, number three, this is, oh yeah, Josh, you got a question? Well, I was just gonna ask for that, is it preferable to make that a variable in your TypeScript and then call it there? Or is it okay to just do the Boolean expression there? Yeah, you know, um, because this is just a you know a matter of a color you kind of, i mean the, the thing about it is that uh in order for it to be yeah, conditional um it really is better to do it with a with a class but consider this because more importantly your class might actually have a number of properties in this case it's just the font color that's the only thing that i've got in this class that's changing right but what if you wanted to change like five different things about it then you really would want to define that in the CSS and you know make sure that it's uh, coming coming through a class so that it's changing a number of things all at once. But yeah, um, is that what you were asking? So I guess I was asking because like in the books they were having us like class dot unavailable equals like unavailable, and then in the Oh the, yeah, you're saying like, file, it ha would have like the variable and then initialized with that. Yeah, it totally depends on um, where the logic is coming from. If I already had logic that was based on something that had been done through like an event handler or something where it was changing a value behind the scenes and that value it already existed, um, then yeah, I would just use the I would just use the boolean variable that's already held in the component um, in the TypeScript file. But in this case, I don't really need to do that because there's no reason for me to go trigger something and update a variable in the TypeScript file when I have the property right here that I want to check. I can just do it like this. So if it's just something simple and the property is available that's coming from, you know, the thing that you're looking at, in this case, plant, because we've got this, you know, loop here, let plant of plants. For something like a loop, this is really the best way to do it because you need to be able to look at it one at a time and it's going to evaluate it for every single one. And like over here, you know, um, that way it can still render all of these regularly. And the only one that it's um, updating is the one that actually matches the expression. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because otherwise you'd have to have like a billion different variables or some other way of tracking it for every single one of these um, dynamically. And that would be kind of a nightmare. Um, so yeah, no, that, and that's actually exactly why Angular is so great you know, the ability to kind of um, have this statement be here and for it to just automatically, you know, true or false, and it'll just apply it as it goes through. And you can just do it right here in the HTML template um, with, with tiny little TypeScript, you know, expressions that, to evaluate. It's nice. Okay, so that is uh, that. So let's let's talk about this whole, you know, splitting things out into multiple components and passing data down from parent to child. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is a big one. We're gonna move this entire fly flower bed that's in the right column. So everything, um, yeah, everything in here. Um, we're gonna move all of this into a new component. So the first thing to do is to create the component, right? So I'm gonna pull up my um, hang on a second. I got to get this where I can see it. Okay. I'm going to pull this up and, um, just do it like this. It'll help. Okay. Uh, I need to make sure I'm in the right folder, first of all. And, you know, not only am I not an app, I actually don't want to be an app. I'm currently in source. Um, I, you know, and I could, um, 
check that with present working directory. Um, yeah, and I'm in source. So I need to, you know, come down um, into app, but I actually um, want to go into the main folder that was created for the main component. And I'm going to put all of my child components of main in, in the main folder. Um, so just like over here in the file tree, you can see that header and main components are inside the app folder alongside um, you know, all of the files that belong to the app component. We're going to do the same thing here where these four files are just going to be alongside all of the folders that belong to the child components. Um, there's lots of different ways to organize your files, you know, here. This is just one of them, um, but it'll work. So I've I've come over here in my terminal, I've navigated into main, and now I'm going to do ng um, generate component, um, and I'm going to call this one flowerbed. And uh, it's created them. And now we can see right here inside of main, we've got a flower bed folder. And inside of that, we've got our four files. So now we can start moving things. So I'm going to take uh, all of this from here to here. Nope, not to there, to here. Um, I guess I can take the instructions too while I'm at it. Um, that's fine. And um, in here, I'm going to just do app flower bed, right? Um, because we need to be able to place that component in now. And then this content will replace the default uh, content with our um, code that we're bringing over. And I'm going to uh, move that back, good. And then I've got a note here, you know, that we need to make sure we pass selected plants down into this component because, um, you know, now our page is broken uh, because it does not know where to get, you know, and get the data that it needs for this. I'm referencing the selected plants everywhere, um, but it doesn't exist in this component. So this is where we come over into, you know, in this child component, we're going to come over and we're going to establish this um, variable that's going to be input. Um, and notice as I was doing that, that it updated it for me, um, you know, depending on kind of how your uh, IDE or text editor works, sometimes that'll just, you know, do that for you. But otherwise, you can come over here and you can add it yourself. Um, and I'll just say selected plants. Um, and I'm going to, uh, nope, that should be, uh, yes, plants, plural. Okay. And then I also um, need to, you know, import that plant. Um, class that comes from the shared folder that we established. And um, I'm just going to make this an array of plants um, and initialize it to an empty array because it's actually going to be coming from the parent. Now, this is something that if you uh, have had an experience with React at all, um, in React, they have nice names for these things that makes it easier to understand conceptually. Um, and one of the things they talk about is the idea of holding state um, in, in, in lifting state so that it stays in the parent component. So that's the place where you're, you know, retrieving the data. It's where you're manipulating a lot of the data. And so you make sure to hold that up high to where you can just pass what's needed down into the child components and not have a lot of, you know, changing of data necessarily. And then another term that they use with React that's super cool is props which just means properties. And it kind of is a, a great way to refer to, this is how we're gonna you know, pass something down. So in that, with that model, you know, selected plants is now a prop that we are passing from the parent to the child. Um, and we just, all we have to do is take the data and use it. Um, so if we go back over to our main component in the TypeScript file, um, we can see that we, you know, we've got the selected plants ready to go. Um, we just have to pass it down. Uh, and we've got all the logic here that is like updating that um, when we you know, click on things on the left column. Uh, so if we come over to our template in the parent and we come back to where we placed this flower bed component in, this is where we use the property binding to pass it down. So I'm gonna say selected plants and equals selected plants. Cause in this case, I've given them the exact same name um, both in the parent, um, sorry, this is the, this is the target. So this is in the child component and this is, um, the parent, uh, and if I wanted to, I could change it and just say, you know, maybe I want to call it plants in the child component or something. I could, 
Um, but for the sake of not having to update a billion things in um, in here, everywhere we've talked about selected plants, I'm going to just do that. So um, that'll take care of that. However, we also have some functionality, right? We created up here, we have this, um, you know, uh, open name input uh, handler. Down here, we have a save name handler. Um, we also have the name and uh, what was the other one? Oh, editing name, um, things that we're using. And these really do truly belong just to, you know, the flower bed. So these are things that are not worth trying to hold up, in, you know, up in the parent. We, we need to move them to where they're actually needed. So I'm going to take um, these and pull them right out of here and move them, not there, here into the child component where they're now useful. And then I'm going to do the same thing with those two handlers that specifically are going to involve um, just the editing of this name um, and saving it. So there we go. Come back down here and I'll grab both of these, pull those out, come back over to uh, the flower bed. Now we're in the child you know, TypeScript file. And now these are exactly where we need them um, in, the, in their correct component because they're now being used in the flower bed uh, template. So um, that should take care of that. Let me check and see if we have any more to-dos for number three. Oh yes, there's the, um, the definitions uh, for CSS. I'm gonna move these into that component as well. This is why I mark them with to do's, guys. Uh, so we need flowerbed.component.css. Okay. So I'm going to move these in, and now it has access to the styles that are really only specifically for this component. Josh, you got a question? Yeah. Sorry, real quick. Um, so I know you said in this instance it didn't make sense to pass it from the parent to the child, but can you do, I mean, you can do multiple. Yeah. You can add as many as you need to with that property binding. Mm hmm. And it's, it's actually very common to do that. Um, so if I had other things that I was tracking in the parent, um, let me get to the right thing here so I can. If I had multiple things that I was tracking in the parent um, that I needed to pass down, I could just keep going with, you know, typing them. prop okay. two equals, you know, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Okay, just wasn't yeah. sure the syntax. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You just have to, yeah, you just tr treat, them, treat them, you know, un uniquely, um, you know, one target for one source. That's it. Okay, so now if we come back over here, we should see everything looks just the way it did before. All the functionality, oh, uh, is almost the way that it was before. Has it not caught up with the CSS? What happened? Hold on. Did I not move that to the right place? It's there. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, I know what it is. Ha ha ha. I didn't just move. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have not done this part part four yet, which is to move the uh, other stuff. And there's actually CSS that belongs to um, the selected plants as well. And now this code is in flower bed. So temporarily we would need to move this here and then we'll actually move it into the other new component that we create in a second. But the selected plant and the big num classes needed to be available to um, if I can get to it. I have too, too many things open. Um, need to be available here, class big num, because this is all inside the flower bed, right? So now if we come back, everything should look the way that it's supposed to. Yep, there we go. Okay. Now, ordinarily, you plan this out in advance, and then you don't have to move things around. But we know we're building this a little bit of time. We've been unpacking all of these concepts over three classes. So, you know, I'm moving them instead of just creating them there in the first place. But, um, Okay, so we, uh, that's the wrong one. So now we've got our flower bed moved. We're passing down the selected plants array um, to have all the selected plants in um, now, you know, present here so that we can use them. So part four is to, um, not sure why, there we go. Part four is to um, actually move the selected plant card uh, into a selected plant component. And then we'll actually loop over the component 
um, and have multiple instances of this new selected plant co component that we're going to create. And I am going to put the selected um, plant component right alongside flower bed inside main here. Um, I'm not going to, I mean, you could put it inside a flower bed, but um, there's a, to a certain degree, you know, it's only for the sake of you not know, having a super long list. And so at this point, um, I don't, I don't mind putting it here. So I'm going to do another um, NG, G for generate, C for component. And then we're going to call this one selected plant singular, because it's going to represent just one of those little plant cards. So we'll let it create it right there in the main folder. And there it is. Okay. So now we can take this next step of moving um, this um, div with um, the image and the, the number um, that's inside of it into a separate component. So it can just take care of, of you know, that little bit of code. But I've got a note here that I wanna actually move, uh, I wanna separate the ng4 from this card um, class. So what I'm gonna do is create an ng container. So it doesn't create another div, um, it just gives me um, a way to wrap it. So just for the sake of the loop. So I'm gonna take um, the loop out of the div and put it in the ng container. And then we should be able to um, tap into app selected plant. Um, and all of this we can take out and put in that component now. And so we'll be looping um, through all that code because it's going to be coming from here. Um, but of course, now it's looking for this selected plant and it doesn't know where to get it from because we have to pass that down. So we'll come over here in the selected plant component to the uh, TypeScript file. We're going to use um, input again. And it went ahead and automatically added it for me up here in the uh, imports. And we'll call it selected plant. And um, it is, of course, going to be a plant. Um, and we can just say, you know, new plant and give it, you know, uh, zeros and empty, empty strings uh, just to initialize it um, according to the constructor right there. But it's going to be replaced with, you know, um, whatever is actually coming down from the flower bed um, for each one. So uh, that's all we need there. Um, so let's see, let me take a look. I think the last thing is to move the, oh yeah, and we have to pass the plant in. So we, we've done the child side, let's do the parent side. We're gonna actually say that selected plant, the target that's defined in the child class is equal to plant. Um, oh no, selected plant. We do have it called selected plant. Yeah. And, you know, there again, I could have called this plant over in the child class and, you know, done that. That's fine. Um, but you can also have this, you know, have this be the same. That's fine. But you do have to define them separately for Angular. You have to have the target on the left and the, um, source on the right. So when you guys are doing your graded assignment six, hint, hint, just keep that in mind. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's do the CSS now that we've got um, this taken care of. Uh, we'll go to here and grab this and uh, come over to selectedplant.component.css and paste this in. And now um, this, these classes are available to the selected plant component um, so that it can display each one of those instances with that styling. Um, so let's come over here and take a look. If I start adding these in, there they are. And so you can see now that I've got, you know, each one of these is a separate instance of that component. This is a selected plant component. This is a selected plant component. But because I'm passing down unique information into each one, each one has a different plant, it's going to display, you know, that that unique um, data in the in the image that goes along with it and all of that. Um, we can look at this in the uh, in here too, and kind of see, you know, how it's me. 
okay, this is where having a big screen is super helpful. <laughs> like way over here. Okay. Um, yeah. So you can see here that um, it's got, you know, the, it doesn't look terribly different in the um, actual like HTML in the browser because it's just piecing it all together. You can still see it all in one place. You can see what's nested inside what, um, but you can see here that this is now based in app selected plant. Um, and there are multiple ones, right? App selected plant, app selected plant, but they each have unique, um, you know, identifying information behind the scenes. And they're each displaying different data that you can see is coming from each plant that's in that selected plant array. Does anybody have any questions about this? Um, yeah, you know, I know this is a lot, um, but to learn, you know, in, in three short classes, but this is a gr really good foundation if you want to keep, you know, building with this. Um, you can you can use this all all the knowledge that we've just given you in the last three classes, is um, you know you can do a lot with it, obviously, and you can do more. So let me talk a little bit about kind of what I would do next if I was going to continue with this. Um, in the spirit of breaking things out into multiple components, your next question might be, well, shouldn't we take all of these available plant cards over here on the left and put them in separate components? And the answer would be absolutely. The problem is we don't have time to teach you the extra syntax that you need to learn in order to do that because all of the events that are generated are generated out of each one of these, right? So... If I click on this, if this was a child component, I would need to have a way to notify the parent component which one of these had been clicked so that it could then communicate back down to this child component um, what it needs, you know, what needs to be updated as a result. And that's, you know, not a huge hairy deal as long as you know how to do it. Um, and it's, so just like there's an input decorator, there's also an output decorator, but you can't use output alone. You also have to use this built-in event listener um, for Angular called event emitter. And um, so once you kind of have, you know, imported that and you know how to use it, you just, then you can emit events from a child up to a parent to say, hey, this thing got clicked and here's the data that you need. And then it can kind of flow up and then back down to other child components from there. Um, so that's that's kind of really the main reason that I can't split this out um, for you guys now, um, but it would be absolutely the next thing I would do would be to, to separate this out um, so that these are just instance, you know, multiple instances of a small component that just does its one job of displaying that little bit, you know, all these, this little stuff right here. Um, and I also, if I was then going to take this like whole app uh, to the next level, you'd say, well, what if you have multiple flower beds? Well, yeah, like maybe you want to have multiple instances of the flower bed, but that would involve a lot of logic um, updates because then you have to have ways to actually tag each one as a unique one. And you and you can no longer just use the plant class with num available and num allocated to get these numbers because they'd have to be split out between different flower beds. So you'd have to have some other data structures for tracking all of that. Um, and it can be done. Um, I, abs I mean, I know how I would do it. Um, but it, it it definitely would be a way a way step beyond what you guys are you know ready for and what we have time for. Um, but you know these are the kind of things that you you think through when you're designing something like this. Is you know um, you know how do I need to structure this all out so that I can accommodate you know manipulating the data on different levels. So this is kind of what we would call a proof of concept. Um, or actually no, this is what we would call an MVP. Um, you know, minimum viable product. Um, we've talked about that term before, where I just kind of show you, you know, this is the, the basics to get this thing on the page. Um, and really, this is, I mean, it's a little bit beyond an MVP because I made it look really pretty. Most MVPs don't have to be super pretty. Um, they just have to be functional. And then you would kind of grow it and, and you know, and add functionality from there and, you know, um, build it up bit by bit and to have additional features and you know, to be able to have multiple flower beds. And maybe you have a whole nother section that's uh, for, you know, uh, some sort of drag and drop, you know, landscape architecting where you can, you know, arrange your flower beds on a little grid or something. I mean, you know, you could, you could go really, really far with this app, right? Um, but this is just one little corner, one little piece has a little bit of functionality just to kind of give you a taste of what it looks like to wire all this stuff up. 
that makes sense. Eric, you got a question? Yeah, and I, I believe this is definitely outside of the scope of the class, but you know, you talk about Angular being something that you can build these apps with if, and how there are whole you know, household company names or household name companies that use Angular to develop their um, you know, user experience. What what does that look like for like multiple pages or like things that relate to each other? Because like yeah, obviously you're not going to go to a website and only go to visit one page. Like so, would you right. have separate apps or separate like <clears throat> you know initialized thing like Angular projects to handle all of that? Like what does that look like? Um, you know, it would be a single single app for everything that's related. So that's where Angular routing is really helpful, um, so that you can. Um, associate components with routes uh, so that what the user sees, you know, in, in the up in the URL is, um, but you could have a completely different file structure for how you do it. Um, there's things called services in Angular um, that you can establish to help uh, with things like, you know, tracking who the user is and um, whether they're logged in or not um, and authenticated. Um, and, you know, what, what data has been, you know, selected in one place that you can then use on multiple pages. Um, all of that can be connected. Um, and I did look up those household names later, by the way. I just forgot to mention them in the last class. Um, Samsung, Sony, Google, Microsoft. Um, there's, uh, gosh, there's so many more. Uh, Forbes. Uh, who else did I see? There were a lot of, a lot of, I mean, big, big, big um, that use use Angular for some of their stuff. So uh, yeah, you can create massive, massive stuff. Um, and there's so much more to Angular that helps you do all of that. Yeah, if you if you take one of those really big courses on Udemy, like like Max uh, Schwartzmuller's, Schwartzmuller's class, um, he gets into a lot of it. Like that's, that's a, I want to say that course has like upwards of 60 hours of um, training. Um, it's extensive, and there's some other ones out there like that that really dig in and show you how to how to get into the more complex um, stuff. And that's not even counting, you know, wiring it up to some sort of backend. And but yeah, I just want to add, Carrie. This is Zach. Uh, that is a great course. So if mm -hmm. anybody wants to learn Angular more, uh, uh, Max Schwartzmuller's super yeah. good course. Yeah, I, I've taken his uh, his React course, his um, Angular course. He has a great JavaScript course that I haven't taken, but I know, I know he's got one. He's got a clean code course. He's got a lot of stuff out there. He's a really great instructor. Highly recommend him. And you can get those courses for like 15 or 20 bucks when, when uh, Udemy has sales, which they do all the time. There's also a way to spoof it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Creating a fake email and then gifting it to yourself at any time but yeah if you can't wait a week or two then yeah you can do it that way <laughs> yep <clears throat> okay um well if there aren't any other last minute questions here i'm going to send you guys off to studio it is uh well, i was about to say 7 30 but for you it's 6 30 um so uh i will see you here at eight o'clock your time and we'll do a review of the studio uh, let me actually uh you know go to you know slide for that oh for heaven's sake um <laughs> here we go fine um I miss my monitor. Okay. Uh, yes. So you should already have the repo from last week. It's the same repo. Um, you just need to change branches branches for the studio uh, three class um, or branch, I mean, and then um, run NPM install again, just in case the dependencies have changed. I don't know if they will or not, but um, well, oh, but it's a new branch. So yeah, you need to run NPM install again. Um, you're going to add equipment. So it's going to be kind of based on what you did last week, where you've got those columns with list of equipment, list of crew members. You're going to um, learn how to add equipment to and from a cargo hold dynamically, um, add some little buttons in and things. Um, and you're going to select crew members and be able to kind of you know display some of their um, information. And you'll also add some conditional classes for you know conditional um, styling and things. So um, we will go over that when we come back.